There you go. Welcome back, everyone, to our Thursday afternoon VTS series. And today we have David Matteson from Cornell University as a speaker and as a kind panelist. We have Yao Zheng and Ines Wilms that I thank very much for accepting our invitation uh, to give a seminar and uh, to attend as guest panelists. So David, uh, the floor is yours, so you can upload your slides uh, again. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the organizers and the panelists for joining today. I'm very excited about time series, of course, and, and that this um, series has, has done so well and, and that the rest of this season looks fantastic. So I, I'm honored to be a part of it, so thank you. Um, Today, I'm going to talk about uh, some work that I did with one of the panelists, Ines, uh, on sparse identification and estimation of high dimensional vector autoregression plus the moving average. So we're, we've had quite a bit of early work just working on VARs, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the context of moving from VARs to the Varma model. Um, so I work at Cornell University. I'm also now affiliated with the National Institute of Statistical Science, and I'll do a shameless plug for a new journal we recently started called Data Science and Science. Um, and there's a special issue right now on uh, modern applications of data science to finance. Um, the paper that I'm going to, or today's talk will be based on a paper that appeared in uh, JAS at the beginning of 2001. So there's a couple links, the old archive link and a direct link here, uh, if you want to get more details than I can give in today's talk. Um, so the first, I wanna acknowledge my co-authors on this. Uh, Ines and Shimanta were the lead authors um, and Jacob and I have been longtime collaborators. Um, there was a period of time where all four of us were at Cornell together and that was, those were very special times. So um, my main advice to everyone from today is uh, work with people that you enjoy, so. Uh, and then this work was supported by several different grants, in, including myself, National Science Foundation grants, uh, Xerox Park Faculty Research Award, and an award from Cornell's um, Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future. So today's talk is primarily about multivariate time series, and I've got a couple of cartoons to help illustrate um, the different uh, models that we're working with and try to emphasize the, the relative dimensions of, of different components within the models. So we, we have in mind a vector time series. So the vector are, uh, observations are represented by these vertical bars and usually T will denote a time index today. So capital T might be a terminal time index, for example. So we have a sequence of vector observations, Y1. So Ys are our notation for our response. Uh, or observed time series. Y1 is our first observation, all the way up to YT. Um, I don't really have in mind that there's serious missingness in the time series, but of course that's very prevalent. Um, the height of this bar would, would be the dimension of the uh, observations at each time point, and that'll be denoted D throughout the talk, so D for dimension. And a couple of the goals from today's talk are trying to say something about what's going to happen next and to do that for the entire vector. Uh, the, the reasons for this is we're often interested in joint outcomes and thinking about how they co-depend. But also when we think about predicting a single component, um, we can reduce variance as long as we have a, a well-specified model by conditioning across additional information or additional time series. Uh, next steps kind of beyond today's talk though is really trying to look at how the components interact. So starting to, in, to dissect the models that we fit and um, interpret them uh, at, and conduct some more uh, basic inference about parameter coefficients that are estimated. So our favorite model for a long time in the high dimensional case has been the vector autoregression or, or I'll, today I'll call it the VAR model. So the vector autoregression, I've got an, another cartoon illustrated, but the model I have in mind is on the top. So I've got my vector response y. It's regressed on lags of itself, and it has a coefficient at each lag. So in this case, tau is my lag. I'm looking backwards one step all the way up to p tilde steps. So I'm going to use p for something else today. So p tilde is just uh, a substitute. And then I've got some error term. 
and Saraterm will get extra attention today um, as we move through the talk. The big thing to emphasize is that this coefficient in front of our lag regressors is a matrix. So that's what makes multivariate time series particularly challenging. So from the cartoon, we can see that the matrix itself is going to be D by D. So it's going to grow with the order of the dimension squared. And we have one of those for each lag that we're considering in our auto regression. So in this case, up to P tilde. Um, there's another parameter in the model that I, I won't focus on today, but not because it's not important. It's, um, it just takes extra consideration. So the error term, uh, in this case, epsilon, um, there's parts of today's talk where I will assume normality. There's other parts where it can be dropped, uh, but there's, there's lots of work to do in terms of extending this type of analysis to heavy tail settings. Um, so I, I don't want to uh, cheat and say that we don't utilize normality in some cases, but um, there is a contemporaneous covariance matrix capital sigma associated with this error term, and that's D by D as well. Um, so we observe a time series Y1 through Y capital T, and to fit this model, we have a lot of parameters. So I'm emphasizing the D squared plus times P tilde. Um, I've dropped the intercept from today's talk. Uh, there's some pre-processing you can do to remove that in some conditions. Um, and I'll, I'll just be focusing on these uh, lag coefficient matrices. So that was the old model. I want to introduce my new favorite model, the Varma, and I'm going to try to sell this to you uh, today and, and hope that um, more of you will be adventurous and give this a try, especially in applications. So you, you've maybe experienced it in univariate settings, but the, the multivariate vector autoaggressive moving average, or VARMA, uh, has some unique challenges to actually apply it in practice. So here's uh, the model in algebra on top. We still have lagged, um, lagged values of the response variable as possible predictors. We have a contemporaneous noise term. Note that I switched to A here. I just want to be distinct that the error term in the Varma model is different than the error term in the vector autoregression. So this is my innovation process A. And what's new now is that there's lagged values in my regression of the innovation process 18. The lags go from one to P for, for the autoregressive component and one to Q for the moving average component. So everything's multivariate. So these are also coefficient matrices. We see that in the cartoon here. They similarly have dimension D by D for the moving average components. We still have our contemporaneous error term associated with A. Um, one thing that we do need to identify as we specify this model are these maximal lags P and Q. So that will be part of today's talk. And the other part of today's talk will be getting a handle on the dimensionality of our parameter space. So one way to do that is to um, seek dimension reduction in the parameter space, for example, through component-wise or element-wise sparsity. So this model has a lot of parameters. And a question is, if, if we move from the vector autoregression to this mixed model, the vector autoregressive moving average, is there potential to have a much more parsimonious model, in this case, meaning uh, a much smaller model in the parameter space. So is d squared times p plus q potentially much smaller than d squared p tilde on the previous slide? Is there a, uh, a lower order lag model that I can fit if I also include the error correction terms for the moving average versus a very high order um, pure autoregressive model. So before I give a little preview that this does work in, in at least one application very well, uh, I want to add a little bit of notation. Um, and I'm going to define an, an operator that might not be familiar to you. Uh, it's called the max lag operator. Okay. And it's going it's going to operate on this set of coefficients as an array. So either pick the blue ones or pick the green ones. Imagine these are all my cross dependencies at lag one. These are all my cross dependencies at lag P, okay? 
So here's a simple example of three by three case, and I'm going back five lags. So I just have a generic coefficient B. Okay. And I've tried to shade the active set. So I haven't put in numbers, I'm just shading which components are not zero. So sparsity is gonna be a big part of today's talk, um, although reduced rank or other things are alternative modeling strategies. So this is a, um, this might correspond to a vector autoregression going back five lags, for example, in dimension three. And we can see that some components are active at lag five and some components are not. So at lag five in particular, the one, two and one, three components are not active. Similarly, the two, two and three, three. And I wanna say something about the overall sparsity of this particular set of coefficients with respect to the maximal lag order. So for the one, three component, it's not active at lag five, but it is active at lag four. So down here in this L operator, the highest active lag was four for that element in the array. Okay. Anything that's gray in, in this fifth panel needs to be represented with a five. At the highest lag that I considered, it was active, it was shaded. Okay. What's happening in the two, two component? Well, it turned out that one was inactive at all lags in this particular uh, coefficient array. So it gets a zero. So this, this operator L gives a summary of sparsity in one sense. You could think about kind of stacking the coefficients on top of each other and keeping track of the, the heights at the maximums. And so I kind of think of a, land, of a, a cityscape with skyscrapers. And one way that we're gonna reduce the complexity of our model is actually to, to shrink this operator L, to push it towards zero, okay? So higher order lag models, unless we're in a long memory setting, um, usually don't make empirical sense. So instead of just imposing general sparsity across the whole array, we might alternatively in, impose sparsity in the maximal lag order. And ask a question. So how do, yes. So the max lag uh, doesn't allow the case where intermediate lags only are zero and some distance. It lag. only keeps track of the highest one. That's right. Nice. It, 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 it's a one type of summary. You lose some information on sparsity. That's right. So we have the complete information on sparsity from the, from the cartoon. Um, and then we just have a summary of what's happening as we move from the rightmost panel to the leftmost panel. Now, suppose that I want to enforce sparsity in the max lag of a, of a vector autoregression, for example. Well, what kind of penalty would do that? So this is a proposal that we did in earlier work for sparse vector autoregression in particular, but we're gonna use this penalty um, and the max lag operator on both the vector autoregressive and the moving average components today. So the, the formula for it for, for component-wise shrinkage in the max lag order is, is here. It's a little bit um, notation heavy. Uh, there's different structures that we might try to impose sparsity. This is component-wise, so I pick the cross dependencies and I look back across lags. I might wanna do this for an entire row, meaning I, I might like a, a, a common maximal lag uh, for a, an individual series across all other series. For example, I might know that one series has very short memory uh, compared to others, or I might like to do that across the entire matrix so I could have a common maximal lag order. So, so the, the most refined one, if we're going to impose max lag type shrinkage is to do it um, element wise. So let's just look at the cartoon. And what the cartoon is going to illustrate as I slide through is the, the way in which um, this type of penalty function that's keeping track of how big this subset is uh, as we um, increase the lag. So this, this is what's called a, a group lasso pe penalty, and it's a special group lasso. It's, it's for overlapping groups, okay? So my first group for the, uh, for the one four element across all lags is just the, the highest lag. My second group is not the second highest lag, it's the union of the first and second highest lags. Okay? That's what this notation is trying to describe. So group one 
here, group two, group three. Again, this is just for ij equal one, four. And then this goes all the way down um, to the last one. Okay. So this, this one, four element will be zero if this entire group is shrunk to zero. Okay. My max lag will be p if only this first group is shrunk to zero. So in this sense, we're nesting the groups. I'm sorry, I have uh, not quite understood, I must say, this is Sam Grutke for speaking. Uh, are you assuming some kind of unique Varma representation? I mean, there are no. Uh, uh, this this would just be for things? a general coefficient. Um, we, we have in mind that we would first apply this to a vector autoregression. And mm -hmm. this would be a way to simplify the model. So it would provide a specific type of regular regularization. So this penalty would be, it would have a, a coefficient attached to it, and it would be added onto a loss function, like a maximum likelihood or least squares objective function. And we'll see what that looks like in a, in a bit. Okay. So this is a proposed, so instead of just taking like an L1 penalty across all of this, we could do something a little bit more complex. Yeah, but uh, you know, still there is not a unique Varma representation, right? I mean, you could have one with more stuff in the VAR and some with more in the moving average. You are. I mean, well, that's the, I, I'm excited. Not I'm excited to get to some slides ahead. Uh, that's the whole point of today's talk. So this okay. is a yeah, no, 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 very. Astute, this is going to be a problem in Varma, and we are going to have to be very careful. That's right. So okay, I'm yes. I'm waiting. Yes. Then. Oh, okay. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. Um. Okay, but but I do want people to kind of get familiar. We're we're going to one strategy today. You know, you can just do lasso, shrink everything to zero, ignore the lag. I'm saying that you have to specify a maximal lag order just to get started. Okay, and you might pick something ridiculously large. So there is some advantage to uh, knowing that when you started your fit, you pick something big to be conservative, but then you should aggressively shrink the maximal lag orders. You might like additional sparsity on top of that, but um, over-specifying that uh, is, is gonna be a problem in terms of the size of the parameterization. So again, there, there's penalties that exist that can shrink the max lag operator. I'm saying that this formula would do it. Um, and then in the cartoon, this corresponds to uh, overlapping groups um, in a group lasso type setting. Okay. All right. So back, just a reminder, we're, we're mostly talking about Varma today. So I'm potentially wanting to apply shrinkage to both the array of blue coefficients and the array of green coefficients. I don't have a good reason to do that together, so I'll have separate penalties for each one of them. There's a lot of parameters, um, and that's part of the motivation. I need to specify a P and Q, and that corresponds to kind of the overall maximal lag order, and I might like to reduce from that. And this and the switch to the Varma model uh, only represents parsimony, a parsimon more parsimonious model if these maximal lag orders are substantially smaller than it would be for a pure vector autoregression. So I'm gonna do one quick preview before we get into some details. So a question is, uh, does this work? Okay. So let's just look at one real example. Uh, we'll, we'll circle back to this at the end of the talk. So that is, um, can we achieve relatively small maximal lag orders in the mixed model coefficients versus a pure vector autoregression? So this is a, old data set that, I, that seems to be popular example um, in the vector autoregressive uh, setting. So it's, a, it's not a particularly high dimensional example. D equals 16, it's a marketing example. It's looking at uh, product sales. We do some standardization um, of the data set. It's not a particularly long time series, but it's relatively high dimensional. So given, given um, this, the 16 dimension relative to length uh, 76. Um, 
D squared is, is big compared to T. So we specifically try to make things a little bit more stationary. Uh, we look at log differences, so specifically sales growth. Okay, I'll, I'll have a plot. Sorry, let me show you. Plot of the time series. I will circle back to this. I just wanted to give you a hint of what it looks like. So it's not clear the variance is entirely constant throughout all this. We are ignoring that, but um, things seem to be mean reverting otherwise. So we'll, we'll inspect this a little bit later at the end of the talk. This is a preview of the max lag operator if I fit a vector autoregression. Okay. So it's looking at all of the lagged coefficients and summarizing what the maximal lag order selected. My P tilde that I entertained was 13 lags, 13 weeks of sales. Okay. And we see that there's several elements that were active out to 12 weeks. Now there's some extreme sparsity. I've, I've left the empty cells, those correspond to zeros. Uh, I just left out the zeros to keep it from cluttered. But hopefully you agree that uh, this is this does have some sparsity, but it's not an especially sparse fit. So I did something here to try to uh, fit a, a vector autoregression on this data set that induce sparsity in the max lag operator. All right, so in today's talk, we'll, we'll say how to do that for the mixed model. And this is what the result is. So again, maximal lag order 13 was selected for both P and Q, both for the autoregressive part of the model and the moving average part of the model. And you can see that the dramatic reduction in the active set. Right? So the maximal lag order overall anywhere was just three. There's much more absolute zeros across the lag order even as we look across both panels. The moving average component doesn't have a whole lot of activity. There's a few things on the diagonal, and then there's a, there's a, a few individual things in a couple specific other places. They are a little hard to interpret. I'm not saying anything about the significance of the coefficients at these levels either. Their point estimates were not zero when this model was selected. On the left-hand side for the autoregressive part of the model, we see that the most important component consistently is autoregression on itself. So the, um, the sales of beer was, uh, changes in sales of beer, or the sales growth rate in beer was highly related to what it was the previous week. Same for bottled juice. So the, the, the flip between these two fits is, is my big motivation for Maybe if you're getting a relatively dense VAR, even if you tried to do sparse estimation, give the VARMA model a try. Let it do some of the error correction with the moving average terms. So why hasn't this been tackled and, and widely used already? Well, the biggest challenge is that the VARMA model is not unique in general. Okay? So this, this is not a problem in the univariate setting, but in the multivariate setting, it is. And so, so you don't necessarily encounter this in, until your multivariate time series course. So let's talk about what this, what this issue consists of. So here's our mixed model on the top. We've got our autoregressive and moving average components. There's a little bit more compact way to represent this in what's called the lag operator notation. So this is a, this is an, a, an operator with, defining, sorry, that's a function of these coefficients. And this is similar to an operator uh, for these coefficients. What specifically does that mean? What's the identity minus the coefficients taken to lags of different powers? Okay. What does that mean? Hopefully you've seen this before in, in various textbooks. Um, so it's, it's just lagging the time series. So wherever there's a T, I go back, uh, whatever the power is on my lag operator, that many time steps. Okay. So I'm saying that with this definition of the lag operator, this representation of the Varma is the same as this one. It's just that I've moved uh, the autoregressive component to the left-hand side. All right, so I'm not gonna use this a lot except for to just make the next few slides a little bit more compact. There's autoregressive coefficients, there's moving average coefficients. They're in here and here, respectively. 
Okay, so this model is not identifiable in general. So there's, there's, um, we are going to assume that we are working in the space of invertible and stable models, though. Okay, so there, there's even further considerations that that make multivariate time series models hard to work with. Um, so we're ignoring those that so we have a well-behaved time series to start with, and we're focusing on the identification problem. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about what the the nature of the identification problem is, but um, you can imagine that there's potentially some substitution effect. So there's some representations where we account for high order lags with lag values of Y, but there might be equivalent ones where we could do that with lag values of A. We have a lot of flexibility because the A's are, are um, unobserved. Um, so I'm instead going to talk about focus on what is identifiable. Okay. So the Process Y under our invertibility and stability pre-assumptions does have an infinite order vector autoregressive interpretation. Okay, so this is a, a in our lag operator notation. This is a pure vector autoregression. Okay? Where does this come from? It comes from doing algebra on the lag operators. Okay? So this gets a little bit fancy. Um, I can refer you to Luca Paul or Brock Juan Davis or Say's textbooks, for example. On, on working with these operators. But um, there's a different set of coefficients, pi, and they go on ad infimum uh, to represent the mixed model. So here I have coefficient um, polynomials that are fixed order, p and q. And I can convert that to an infinite order polynomial in these other coefficients, pi. So what is identifiable is this representation. This representation with respect to pi is unique. So the, the Varma representation is uniquely defined with respect to this pi operator, but there might be multiple sets of phi and theta that can produce the same pi operator. So let's define what we call an equivalence class to characterize the set of all equivalent models that produce that same pi. Okay. So this is my notation for the set. And it's going, I'm going to restrict it a little bit. I'm going to only look at MA and AR models up to order P and Q. Okay. So the set would change if I change P and Q. Okay, it's an equivalence class for a specific uh, unique um, var infinity representation. So what does it consist of? Well, it's a set of Varma coefficients, the pair. So this is the uh, concatenation of all the coefficients here. It's a pair such as this equation satisfied, okay? And when we say that there's not a unique representation in general, there's, there's multiple elements that might satisfy this equation, okay? So this, this equation was the same uh, just a, a, a rewrite of this one. All right, so <clears throat> how do we address this um, in the past? So there's a, there's a few different representations. So you can impose kind of a structural assumption on the coefficients that you want to estimate. Uh, one's called the echelon form. There's another one called final equations specification. Uh, and you can kind of assure uniqueness of the Varma representation that way. They're not, they're a little bit unwieldy to work with in higher dimensions. Um, they're not widely available in software packages. They're not easy to study theoretically in that they add additional constraints. They're not easy to regularize in familiar ways either. So if I want to um, fit my model in a high dimension, I need to impose some shrinkage of some type uh, to, to get an estimate. These are hard to work with. Okay. So we're, I'm proposing an alternative today. So again, this is our notation for that equivalence class. And what we're going to do is pick a target in here. Okay. We're going to find a unique value within this equivalence class. So among all the feasible AR and MA matrix pairs, 
we're going to select the one that gives the most, I'm going to say, parsimonious representation of the, of the Varma. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to have to decide as, as the user what I mean by parsimonious. This is somewhat unlimited, but I'm going to, I'm going to use basically convex regularizers. I'm going to measure how big uh, my coefficient arrays are for the AR part and the MA part. And you might have suspected I'm going to use my maximal lag order to keep track of um, how sparse my, my coefficient arrays are. You could just do L1 penalty, you could do some reduced rank, um, sorry, some reduced rank regularizers as well. Um, so L1 norm, any convex function in general, we like what we, we were defining as the H lag penalty before. Okay, so now we've added an additional assumption. We're gonna shrink this set that we're gonna consider. This isn't always something you want to do, but we have in mind. So, so we're trying to assure that we estimate a unique model every time we do it. And we're going to say that, well, among all the models in this equivalence class, we're going to move towards this, uh, this direction. Okay. So now we've defined a subset called the sparse equivalence class. Okay. So now it's the argmin across our parameterization, trying to reduce the parameter complexity for the AR and MA parts. I just added them together. Maybe you could think of a different way to combine these. Maybe it's maybe these should be weighted. You want more sparsity in some sense for the MA component, for example. But we pick something, okay? So I'm trying to sparsify in the parameter space. Subject to my uniqueness of the var infinity representation. So this shrunk the potentially shrunk the space of, of equivalent models quite a bit. Okay? I'm, I'm picking an argmin here across all that. But it turns out even that's not guaranteed to be unique. Okay? So having a convex objective was not sufficient. I need it to be what's called strictly convex. So there's just one more technical step. So our, our workaround is a familiar workaround in uh, the lasso type literature, and that's to actually add a ridge penalty as well. So I know that this is a little out there. We're doing regularization on a parameter space now. There's no model being fit. We're, we're we're hypothesizing a model. Um, and now we're saying, suppose a model was fit. I'm not peeking at what the coefficients are now, but I wanna assure that I'm uh, fitting a unique model. How do I do that as I select the model? We're saying that, well, you should think about what, what kind of objective you'd like within that broader space of models. Well, across all the equivalent models, I might prefer a sparse one in this sense. I like the max lag operator to be small. And then I'm gonna have just a, a little bit of a penalty on the squared Frobenius norm. So this is doing something about uh, the size of the coefficients. And there's some alpha term that controls that. And then this is subject to uh, the condition that gets us a unique representation in the var infinity. This looks pretty irritating, but good news. This, this assures now, because this becomes a strictly convex regularization, this is assured unique for any choice of alpha greater than zero. Okay. All right, but now I have to pick an alpha. I don't like that. So let's take the limit as alpha goes to zero. I'd prefer alpha wasn't there. Let's take the limit from above as alpha goes to zero. Okay. So it turns out that this limit exists and it's unique. Okay? This isn't necessarily the same thing as just plugging in alpha equals zero. So we have to be a little bit careful. The algorithm that we implement, we can do that substitution, but it's particular to our choice of estimation algorithm later. And I, and I really haven't talked about estimation yet. 
So our final theorem says that uh, we can be assured within the equivalence class for a particular var infinity representation, if I pick the maximal lag order P and Q, I shrink that equivalence class to a sparse equivalence class, then this representation is this, um, if I take the arg min with respect to Frobenius, squared Frobenius norms, I get a unique representation. So I know that was a lot. Um, I guess what, just a, just a quick review. This representation of the Varma is not unique in general, and we need to be careful. So, you know, if, if one entire row across all of these was zero, I can add something on the left and subtract it off on the right and cancel it out. And that's a, a simple way in which I could see that um, this isn't unique. What is unique though, is the var infinity representation, okay? Within the var infinity representation, I have a lot of choices. How am I gonna pick? Well, I, I need a target. I'm gonna pick a sparse target. I'm saying all these are equivalent. They produce exactly the same var infinity representation. I wanna pick one. I'm gonna choose something that picks a sparse one okay, in some sense. If I'm gonna do that, I wanna use a sparsity inducing regularization idea, but I need it to produce a strictly convex type of regularization. So we had to add the ridge type penalty on top of the L1 type penalties or group lasso type penalties and the limit with respect to that extra ridge parameter produces a unique solution as well. So I don't need to worry about that second step of regularization. So I know there might be questions on this. Um, it is a, a big result in our paper and I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share it. I think that actually imposing sparsity in this or, or any kind of structure really through convex um, regularization in a parameter space has a lot of potential applications in econometrics in particular. And this is one case where we had a, a non-identifiable model. And now we have a strategy if we're willing to target within the equivalence class of exchangeable models, a particular area to focus on, uh, we can do that. We're, we're actually in the next step impose this in our estimation strategy so that we achieve this target and a unique solution each time. Uh, so, sorry, can I just uh, uh, ask a question? What, what, if, what if you had two sets of uh, ARMA coefficients that all have the same Frobenius norm? Uh, I mean, I, I, sorry, just to, to rephrase, uh, uh, are, are you prove that, that this set is unique? There's only one point in there? Did I understand that correctly? Yes, there's only one point, and it's the point that also minimizes the Frobenius norm. Wow, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we, you know, we, we borrow from like a long literature in the lasso. So it, 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 um, it, it's kind of like the L1 penalty got really popular. We do use the L1 penalty as a, as a uh, a specification in our model. We also try the H like penalty. So we use both. And um, yeah, I guess this type of result has is not really been used for identification before. So I think that that's our bigger contribution. Um, but, you know, adding a rich penalty and, uh, and thinking about limits with respect to that coefficient has been done. So, sorry, sorry, I must also say I'm a little surprised that uh, you get a unique model that way, but uh, it is, uh, yeah, uh, great. I no, we, we, I, we're very excited about this. And, and again, you know, I've suggested some choices that kind of fit the way I want to model later, but you don't have to do our max lag operator. You, you can pick the structure you want. You just need to impose that structure using something convex. And if, you, if it wasn't also strongly convex, you can add these additional arguments um, to, to add the ridge penalty. 
And even the ridge thing could be different. You know, it, it could be something else here. It doesn't have to be the squared Frobenius norm. It just has to be something that induces strict convexity. May I ask you another question? So yes. and another model that has received a lot of attention, you know, to achieve parsimony is a kind of factor model. And one way to get that out of a vector autoregression, for example, is to impose a reduced rank uh, conditions on, uh, on the coefficient matrices. So for example, if each of your bi is equal to say ai times c, then they would give you this. So if the true model is characterized by these that are basically nonlinear constraints on, on the coefficients, would the, your procedure uncover that uh, or does it only say uncover zero type of restrictions on single coefficients? Yes, the short answer is yes. And I can't work quickly enough to get that paper done. So I invite you okay. guys to work on this. So okay. I guess the, the main thing, you know, you're gonna swap out H lag penalties here for something that imposes reduced rank. You're going to have extra issues with kind of ties and eigenvalues or, or, or things like that. So you'll have to sort your factors in some way and impose something else. And it's a little bit analogous to, to this. Okay. So you might sort your factors by, you might have to do something more exotic, like by skewness or something. Um, yes, I, I think it's it's a exciting next step we've we've kind of stayed on this path and and pushed it a little further in some of our follow-up work but um and there's you know and basically any linear model a multivariate linear model in particular that has identifiability issues it, it doesn't even have to be time series so um, i just love time series but it it always makes uh, theory a lot harder. So um, progress is a little bit slower. All right, so I spent a lot of time on identification, but I also think that that was in some sense our biggest contribution. Um, so I, I will go a little quick through estimation. Estimation is its own unique challenge here. So why? Well, this is a multivariate regression, but it's special because this is the lag regressors A are not observed. Okay? So I can't just do least squares here. So I'd love to, when I fit the uh, VAR model, I just do least squares on this part uh, and, and add some kind of shrinkage penalty. So what's our strategy? Well, we're gonna suppose that we could do this estimation in two steps. We're going to estimate an, an an auxiliary model and try to get a pre-estimate of these A's, these lagged A's. And we're gonna suppose that that's good enough. We'll derive some theory to say conditions under which it is. And one, once we have that, then we will fit this like a multivariate regression. So it's, this will be in two steps. We approximate the unobserved errors, these lagged A's, and then we plug them in and we estimate via multivariate regression. So step one, well, we know that there's, our goal is to fit a Varma. If the Varma is correctly specified, there's a, a VAR infinity representation. A good approximation of that would be a high order um, vector auto regression. So I can't fit infinity in practice without some kind of uh, parametric constraint. So I'm just going to pick some large value p tilde. I'll p, pick p tilde sufficiently large. Large might be with respect to what the sample size is, the terminal sample size, capital T. Um, and then I'll have to use some kind of regularization even to estimate that model. So, so step, step one, we're actually going to fit a var. I'm not talking a lot about what we do specifically here. I'll, I'll have to point you to some of our earlier work, but you could imagine just putting a lasso penalty on this, for example, or a ridge penalty. Once we have that, we have estimates of the residuals from that equation. Okay, so I'm going to get pi hats and then I'm going to estimate epsilons. Okay, so these residuals are going to get plugged in and I'm plugging them in to this equation. Okay. 
Before I had A's, now I have epsilon hats. This was an appropriate substitute for the lagged A's because these are in the same equivalence class, okay? The VAR representation and uh, the moving average representation, okay? So this was, you know, as long as I was fitting an adequately large vector auto regression and I had um, sufficiently small estimation error on the coefficients, I should have a good estimate of these residuals. And now I have a new error term here, U, instead of just A. I'm not putting in the lagged epsilons because I'm trying to estimate these coefficients here. And this error term will correspond to the contemporaneous error before, but it also has to account for the error in that these are not the lag days. These are my estimates of the lag days. Okay, So this has two sources of variability in it. So I need to give it a new name. It still means zero, uh, but it has its own covariance matrix that I'm not talking a lot about today. So how do we estimate this model? Well, this is still heavily parameterized, so maybe an L1 penalty or try the H lag penalty. So let's be specific here. In phase one, this is in matrix notation. I set up my matrix regression with the entire time series panel, the entire panel of lagged regressors. And I, I'm gonna use a least squares loss function, and I'm gonna add on uh, a penalty parameter times in this case, my H like penalty or your reduced rank penalty or any anything you want here. Um, that's gonna make estimation feasible. So we'd like the H lag penalty because it's gonna impose this hierarchical type of sparsity in the model with respect to lag order. Step two, well, now we have our uh, lag regressor Z as before. Maybe they're not going back as far as we did with P tilde, uh, and then the lagged covariates. What are the covariates? They're the lagged residuals from the first step, okay? This, has to, this penalty parameter has to be selected, so cross-validation or something else is part of the estimation procedure. Uh, so, sorry, can I just clarify? Um, um, why does it make sense to penalize here? Because I mean, if, if... If phi and theta are sparse, it doesn't follow that pi is, is sparse. That's right. right. But I need to estimate a model that does not have too many coefficients. So otherwise, just from the least squares estimation sense, I won't have a unique solution. Mm -hmm. So I got to have my total parameter space uh, for the estimated model be in a sufficiently small subspace. I see. So, but you could potentially use any any other than any other penalization for, for the first. That's right. No? OK. Yep. Yeah. 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 Today I'm doing this one, but that's right. Uh, in our theory, we actually use the L1 because that's easier to do the theory. But uh, here we, we here we apply the H lag penalty to both the MA and AR coefficients. So I, I could have just wrote H lag on the penalties. But this is the explicit formula. Uh, again, this could be something else for each of these. And it doesn't have to match either. Again, there's penalty parameters that have to be selected. Now there's two of them. In terms of selecting tuning parameters like this via cross-validation, I think two is manageable. You start to get to three, uh, it becomes really difficult to, to kind of search over this. Um, and, and I think more than three is, is pretty impractical uh, in general. Um, what is our solution path? Well, this is another contribution in the paper that I can't highlight today, but um, this regression, this regularized regression can be solved in parallel across components using proximal gradient algorithms. So we had to kind of customize our own that would implement this overlapping nested group lasso, um, but we can do this uh, quite efficiently. So a little bit about practical implementation. In step one, we have to specify a high order P tilde. Why? Well, we're trying we're trying to approximate a P, uh, P equals infinity representation. So we should start big, but we do have to do some kind of regularization so that we get a unique least square solution. Once we have that, 
under sufficient conditions, we have a good estimate of the residuals from that model. Those residuals are a good estimate of the lagged innovations in the mixed model because they're in the same equivalence class. Okay? And specifically for some lag orders P and Q. In practice, we are selecting things on the order of T squared. Um, the dimension has less influence in, in this part of estimation. It's more like on the order of log the dimension. Um, so we've picked 1.5. This is kind of a heuristic thing. Um, we, we, we try several uh, in practice, but the, the bigger thing is that you're when you're setting up your first regression, you're you're selecting something that's on the order of the terminal sample size, a square root of the terminal sample size. So it, it seems that you know multiplying this by some factor, there's little sensitivity. You just have to go out far enough to begin with. Selecting that penalty parameter, we do something simple. We just keep track of mean squared forecast error. Um, if you're trying to do one step ahead, this is one step ahead. If you're trying to predict five steps ahead, H is five. Okay, so uh, this is your goodness of fit measure for tuning your regularization. We do that similar for uh, phase one and phase two, but in phase two, it's a two-dimensional grid search. Okay, so we're minimizing the mean squared forecast error with respect to two different lambdas. Um, this requires some sample splitting. So this takes some thought as well. Here we're using 90% uh, of the sample for training. Um, some, just a little bit on theory. Uh, I'll refer you to the paper. So in some of the technical work, we also assume the Varma is uh, Gaussian stable is maybe something a little bit stronger than stationarity. Uh, we don't want to get too close to the boundary of stationarity. Uh, and then invertibility is a condition on the moving average representation. Um, we assume that the finite order approximations are also stable as long as we pick a sufficiently large um, finite order approximation. Okay. And this theory on the next few pages will just be for the lasso type penalty. Um, this is There's just many more known results for doing regularization on this, especially in time series than kind of our more exotic H-like penalty. Uh, this is just notation. We did saw this before. So we're thinking about our matrix representation of our model at the bottom. So the entire array of, of our response and our lag predictors. Okay, so this is for phase one, it's the autoregressive part. And I'll spend a little bit of time here and then um, we'll, we'll circle back to the application. So in phase one, our primary goal is to get good estimates of uh, the error terms. So the prerequisite to that is getting good estimates of the coefficients. Why would this be challenging? Well, the coefficients that we're targeting are actually for the infinite order vector autoregression. We're going to have a truncation of that. So there'll be a part that we're ignoring. Everything beyond P tilde gets zeroed out because we're not even estimating it. So that's implicit. And then with what's left, we want a good approximation. Um, so again, we've got a fixed, uh, sorry, D represents the dimension of the process. Um, I'll say something about stability in a second, but it's invertible and Gaussian. Uh, we, so for us, stability says something about the spectral representation of the time series. I'll have to refer you to the paper for more details, but F represents the spectral, F of Y represents the spectral density matrix of our multivariate time series. Uh, if you haven't done spectral analysis before, this gets a, uh, takes a little bit of time to get used to. And then there's two operators we're applying to measure the size of this matrix. So there's there's one that's kind of keeping track of the smallest eigenvalue and one that's keeping track of the biggest eigenvalue. That's a little bit more complicated than just that. Um, but we're saying that there's over here, it's it's kind of like there's no long memory. The, the, the spectral um, 
density is not diverging. Okay, and we do something kind of hard here. We put a strict upper bound. Okay. So I say long memory because that's a common place where you might see the spectral density the asymptote is near zero. Okay. So this makes sense though, right? I mean, we're trying to approximate a high order model with a finite order model. And if it's a long memory model, there's slow decay in the coefficients. So this is just not gonna work. Um, and then over here, saying something like we, we have support everywhere um, in the spectral density. So there's some lower bound on it. Um, the truncation order that we select, P tilde. So this is, uh, these are asymptotic results, but it should increase um, on the order of uh, one over the sample size. Sorry, if we square it, it should increase on the order of one over the sample size. Um, and then how well behaved does the remainder term that we're ignoring? So here we're looking at the lagged coefficients beyond P tilde. These need to be sufficiently small. So they need to be on the order of log the dimension squared over T. Finally, because we're estimating a sparse model, we need the model for these first p tilde lags to be sufficiently sparse. So for this slide, I, these results are for assuming just a lasso penalty, not the h light penalty throughout. So this is a e easier summary of sparsity. It's just counting how many coefficients are non-zero across this um, all lags, tau one to p tilde. And this K pops out in the result below. So the phase one estimator can't have a lot of activity in the remainder that we're ignoring. So P tilde needs to be sufficiently large. Um, the, the time series itself has to be sufficiently stable. There has to be sufficient, you know, the, the regularization I do has to match what's in the part of the model I'm estimating. So for lasso, it should have a lot of zeros. Um, and if, if that's the case, then we get good estimates of the coefficients up through lag P tilde, and therefore good estimates of the residuals. So what are the main factors? Um, so this is for any fixed, arbitrary but fixed, D, P, tilde, and T. Uh, and you can see that the, the term K comes into play here. So if I'm trying to do this strategy and the true model is not really sparse, it's re reduced rank, this is a very significant misspecification and our, our approach wouldn't work. We, we would need to switch the type of regularization we're doing to a penalty that enforced a reduced rank. And the theory says that. Um, David, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You had a few minutes, so maybe. You can yes, get I will finish up. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so, so the dimension doesn't seem to have too big of an impact relatively as long as uh, there's sufficient sparsity in what's being estimated. Okay, so there's some interplay here and everything's relative to the sample size as well. Um, in the simulation study, I'll have to refer to the paper for this. I'll just do some plots today. There, we fit um, a moving average model uh, and the true model had Q equals one, but we were fitting a higher order model in practice. We just knew that we needed to do some shrinkage. And what this graph illustrates is uh, kind of the reduction in forecast performance um, as we go from what's called an oracle model um, to kind of an idealized model where we know the maximal lag order, the VARMA model, the proposed procedure where we have to estimate the maximal lag order, and a main competitor just fitting a sparse vector autoregression. So this is for a fixed dimension and fixed values of coefficients. And we can see that as um, the size of the moving average coefficient goes up, there's, there's more discrepancy. So if the true model was 
had move, active moving average components and they were numerically large, there's a greater benefit to estimating the varma over the var. If they're numerically small, as you might expect, uh, the results are pretty similar. So we can never get the black line. This is, this is knowing actually what the innovations were. We typically don't know the maximal lag order. So as we move up one, that's the penalty for not knowing the maximal, uh, sorry, for not knowing the innovations. The next one is a very small step. We seem to, when we use the max lag, H lag penalty, we seem to incur very little penalty uh, reduction in performance when we have to estimate the maximal lags. So going from the second to the third line up. And then I'm trying to convince you that because the true model was VARMA, fitting a higher order uh, VAR isn't going to do well if, if the coefficients in the VARMA uh, are sufficiently large. So that's what this last gap is. There's some standard errors here that they were denoted below from the simulation study. So this is not a significant difference. This is a significant difference. How about if we um, you know, change the maximal lag order? Uh, these are roughly parallel, um, but this gap gets a little bit bigger uh, between knowing the maximal lag order and not. Finally, what about as the dimension grows? Well, the problem just continues to get harder. Uh, I don't know if there's a lot of insights here. Um, given this amount of error down at the bottom, all three of these is kind of equivalent performance and this isn't much worse. Um, and then I should conclude just a reminder from our uh, data analysis ex example of, of these 16 time series. The big advantage of, of giving the VARMA model a try is that even if we impose sparsity in our estimation procedure, the result is not necessarily sparse. So here's a, here's a case where there is very significant dimension reduction here, but this is very uninterpretable. This is a model that gave nearly the same fitted values, but has much fewer active coefficients. And it has very high interpretability if I'm willing to deal with the error correction from moving average terms. Strong autoregressive uh, type dependence a lot because the diagonal is included or active across all components. A few cross dependencies that go out a few weeks. Error correction is often happening just on itself, but still a few cross dependencies. Um, this one entertains me a little bit. There's some kind of error correction between beer and cheese. Uh, I'm, I grew up in the Midwest of the United States. This data is from Chicago, uh, Wisconsin is nearby. So there's, there's some error correction in, in sales growth between beer and cheese. Uh, forecast performance. It depended on the horizon. So looking one, eight weeks or 13 weeks ahead, um, marginal improvement at one week, more significant improvements at higher weeks. So it's, we're not necessarily just strictly dominating universally on forecast accuracy. We do think there's an improvement, parsimony, uh, interpretability of the model are, are, are maybe even more significant benefits here. And then finally, uh, I wanted to highlight some R packages that you can try out to implement all of our methods. Um, uh, Big VAR was largely authored by my former student, Will Nicholson, uh, and big time um, by our panelists, Ines Wilms. So thank you all very much for listening. Thank you very much, David, for such a nice talk. And uh, maybe we can uh, open the discussion. And uh, well, since we have our two kind guest panelists, Yao and Ines, I would like to start by kindly ask them if uh, they would like to add some comments. So